Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Secrétaire perpétuel, professeurs, Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour à tous. Merci de nous rejoindre pour ce qui sera notre 13e et en principe dernière séance en ligne. Dès le mois prochain, nous lancerons la formule hybride, en partie dans la salle Roi Baudouin, en partie sur Internet, afin de respecter les règles sanitaires en vigueur et également de permettre à chacun de se déplacer s'il le souhaite. Le symposium d'aujourd'hui sera consacré à la Network à Médecine, un terme apparu pour la première fois dans une publication scientifique en 2007, une approche qui a permis de révolutionner l'étude de certaines maladies. Monsieur le, ah pardon, c'est le, le professeur Jean-Luc Baligan, comme vient de vous le dire le, le secrétaire perpétuel, membre de la première section, qui a préparé ce programme, on le lui doit, ainsi que l'organisation de cette conférence. Monsieur le Président, je me tourne vers vous. Georges Casimir, le premier intervenant, est un membre étranger de l'Académie. Il a accepté de se lever à l'aube pour être avec nous. Oui, merci Vanessa. Euh, donc, chers collègues, euh, mesdames, messieurs, c'est un, un très grand plaisir pour moi également de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour euh, cette séance qui euh, va être fascinante à propos d'un sujet euh, d'actualité remarquable et dont les, les, le futur est certainement particulièrement important, euh, Network Medicine, la médecine des systèmes. Alors, c'est clair que l'ensemble de nos orateurs aujourd'hui euh, vont s'exprimer en anglais et nous allons donc poursuivre cette séance, bien entendu, dans la langue de Shakespeare. In, in recent years, remarkable progress has been made in the process of approaching more and more in depth the complexity of cellular functioning, descending more and more intimately into molecular mechanisms. A genetic individu individualization has naturally been associated with the, this process, which leads more and more to an individualized medicine, which is distinguished by specific modes of diagnosis and treatment. New biomarker and statistical analysis based on artificial intelligence are at the heart of this work. More than ever, cooperation between uh, various professions in medicine is essential to the process. Today, we are going to discuss this fascinating aspect. The symposium is organized by two sections of our academy under the direction of Professor Jean-Luc Baligan, chairman of the first section. Our first speaker is Professor Joseph Loscalzo. Professor Loscalzo is a member of our academy And we are particularly happy to receive it today, to receive him today, even if the health crisis forces us to do it again by video conference. He is Erse Professor of the Theory and Practice in Medicine of uh, Harvard Medical School, Chairman of the Department of Medicine, Physician in Chief, Somerwise Distinguished uh, Chair in Medicine, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He trained in internal medicine and cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, after which he was appointed to the hospital staff and Harvard Medical School faculty. After 10 years on the Harvard faculty, Dr. Loscalzo moved to Boston University as director of the Whitaker Cardiovascular Institute and chief of cardiology. In July 2005, he returned to the Harvard faculty in his current role. Author of more than 1,000 articles, 50 books, and 32 patents, is internationally recognized for his work on the vascular biology of nitric oxide, redox biology, systems pathobiology, and network medicine. He has received many awards, including election to the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Art and Science, and uh, our Academy, Academy Royale de Médecine de Belgique. He has served uh, on several NIH study section and editorial boards, including the New England Journal of Medicine for nine years, editor-in-chief of Circulation for 12 years, and is currently editor-at-large for the New England Journal of Medicine and senior editor of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. Professor uh, 
uh, Los Calzo uh, will talk about the next uh, medicine novel approach to disease and therapeutics. Professor Los Calzo, it's yours. Thank you very much, Professor Casimir, for that very kind introduction. Well, thank you very much for uh, kindly inviting me to participate in this wonderful symposium. I'm uh, delighted and honored to do so. This is an exciting time in this new and evolving field of network medicine, and I'll try to share that excitement with you over the next 25 minutes. Here are my disclosures. So the first question is, why do we need a new approach to disease? And I would answer that question by arguing that conventional reductionism uh, provides increasingly limited insight into understanding biological complexity and complex disease phenotypes. So we need a new approach, uh, given how much more information there is available about disease mechanism and complex therapeutics. Now, there is a long arc of reductionism in biomedicine. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Descartes at the top, at top of this list, but as applied to medicine, um, a good example of this reductionism arc is illustrated in, this, in the panel on the left from a paper my colleague Jeremy Green and I wrote about four years ago. Uh, in this paper, we talk specifically about uh, the pattern of investigation in disease mechanisms over the last 200 years. And uh, we use as an example tuberculosis beginning with the notion of the sick person with phthisis in the 18th century, moving through to identification of the organs and tissues involved with more precision visually using histopathology. Then in the late 19th century, identification of the microbe responsible for the disease, and then ultimately identifying patterns of uh, therapeutic strategies that uh, have led to an increasing level of control of the disease. But the problem, of course, is that uh, the, even before uh, the uh, anti-tuberculous therapies were identified, the disease was changing its ecology. And that led to a reduction in the severity of illness and to its infectivity, really illustrating how complex this interaction between microbe and man is. So the, the 21st century challenge, in contrast to the reductionist challenges of the last two centuries, is the challenge of reassembly, of understanding disease holistically, integratively. I think we have William Osler shown on the right, among others, as responsible for this notion of one system, one organ, one disease, one mechanism. And while that has held us in good stead for many years, it certainly has now run its course as disease definition becomes more complex itself and mechanisms become more difficult to dissect. Now, uh, this problem of reductionism uh, continues right through to the current century with, uh, with the modern genome. And uh, analyzing the genome as we typically do, illustrated here with a Manhattan plot for Crohn's disease, really is an exercise, again, in association and reductionism. As you can see along the, 20, uh, al along the 23 chromosomes, there are hotspots or sites shown in green that statistically significantly associate with the disease. This linear narrative of disease is helpful for us in identifying very strong and potent determinants of disease, uh, but yet, there is, aren't sufficient mechanisms or data for dissecting interactions or complex relationships, which can, which can be much more informative in identifying therapeutic strategies and in determining uh, the uh, optimal approach uh, for, uh, for diagnosis. The importance of genomic context is, is uh, critical here. And as this summary of a paper published now in 2016 by Steve Friend's group illustrates, even in highly penetrant, conventionally Mendelian uh, diseases like smith lemley opitz disease or epidermolysis bullosa simplex, that even in this setting, <clears throat> if you evaluate a number of patients, you'll find individuals 
who do not have any clinical manifestations of the disease. Here they screened um, uh, 874 genes and found 13 adults with eight mutations for severe Mendelian conditions, which they should have manifest, but did not. And their conclusion was these, quote, individuals are buffering the effects of rare, highly penetrant deleterious mutations, unquote. Well, that's really a tautology. The real question is how. So that, uh, that kind of challenge led us, and in this case, the us is Laszlo Barabasi, a uh, physicist and network scientist, and I, along with uh, my colleague, Ed Silverman, to uh, develop, help develop this field of network medicine, which is really a complex systems biology and network science approach to disease and therapeutics. It's predicated on the notion that most biological systems are complex systems, that form molecular networks, and that over the last decade, there have been new quantitative approaches that can be used to analyze these networks. Uh, this field, I, I show shamelessly show a copy of our book from uh, published about three years ago that highlight uh, summary features of the discipline. And even in our, in our Department of Medicine, we have a division that focuses on network strategies for diagnosis and therapeutics. So the first key question is, can molecular networks define genomic context and give unique insight into disease pathogenesis? And, and as an hypothesis that was tested, um, Barabasi and I published in 2011 a concept paper that made the following claim, that if one looks at an integrative uh, 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 network of proteins that associate with each other within the cell, within that interactome, that protein-protein interaction network, one can find discrete subnetworks comprised of a more limited number of proteins that are responsible for a specific disease, which is to say in this universe of protein-protein interactions, disease-determining proteins comprise discrete modules, disease modules, as we call them. And the basis for this hypothesis, uh, the bases are listed here, that proteins involved in the same disease tend to interact, that proteins involved with the same disease therefore tend to cluster in connected subnetworks, that proteins in a disease module are often involved in the same biological process, and this process, these processes are discrete and separate from other proteins involved in other diseases, unless there is a common mechanism between two or more diseases. So these, are, these logically follow from the comments I made on the last slide. And then four years later, we published a, a paper that really provides the evidence for this notion of discrete disease modules in this comprehensive protein-protein interaction network. And on the left, you can see in the whitish background, uh, the uh, actual interactome that we used uh, in this study. It was comprised of over 13,000 proteins that associate with, on average, between 10 and 11 other proteins. That accounts for the 140,000 edges, each of which reflects a discrete interaction between two proteins. And with this interactome, we asked the question, among the 299 diseases that had a sufficient number of known genes or proteins associated with them, do those disease proteins cluster into discrete modules? And I show uh, illustrated here schematically three different diseases or groups of diseases that do so cluster. Uh, and notice that rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis overlap somewhat, which one would expect given their immunologic underpinnings. So how does one create a disease module? How do you derive it from the information in the experimental literature? Well, here's an example um, of such a module's creation by uh, Rusheng Wang um, in my group. We uh, chose in this case for, uh, uh, for illustrative purposes, cerebrovascular disease. We ascertained the disease network components or seed proteins shown in blue 
that associate or are known to associate with the disease. We map the seed proteins to the interactome. And then we identify connector proteins shown in gray, which weren't previously known to associate with the disease. And then we statistically assess how discrete and separate this module is from another module comprised of a random number of uh, equivalent, a random number of, uh, of, of proteins in the interactome. So the key message in this slide is that the interactome provides the missing links among the disease associated proteins in the disease module. That gives the module integrity and it begins to identify pathways <laughs> that regulate the disease that may not previously have been recognized. Now, um, I don't have time to go through these specific examples in any detail, but here I illustrate six diseases that we have examined in this way, we and other groups have examined in this way. And from, from this examination, we've identified novel disease mechanisms or drivers that weren't previously appreciated. And as you can see, these disorders run the gamut of uh, diseases from preeclampsia to aortic valvar calcification, to steroid resistant asthma, <clears throat> to type two diabetes, and more recently to, uh, uh, to pulmonary arterial hypertension and perivascular fibrosis, as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'll come back to a couple of these in a moment. So now can we bring together this notion of an interaction network and the conventional genomic notion of genetic variants associating with disease? How does one inform the other or, or does one inform the other? Well, in a recent paper earlier this year, my colleague Fei Sheng Cheng and I, uh, and a host of other collaborators, published a paper which um, I think begins to make the argument that network analysis does indeed inform genetic variation associated with disease and vice versa. In this case, we looked specifically at mutations shown in the yellow stars that um, are found on proteins associated with a particular disease and their localization to the interface binding site between two proteins versus non-interface sites shown in blue. And an analysis in this case of germline mutations associated with non-malignant disease, an analysis of the localization of these mutations, obviously we had to know the the three-dimensional structures of the proteins to do this, indicates that there's a, bit, a between a six and eight-fold increased prevalence of mutations at interface sites versus non-interface sites among mutations known to cause germline disease. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, Feishon went on to look at somatic mutations in cancers and found a similar relationship, about an, an eight-fold difference in the prevalence of mutations at interface protein binding sites compared to non-binding sites for all but one of the malignancies that he explored in the cancer genome atlas. So I think these are fairly convincing data of the importance of protein-protein interactions in governing disease mechanism. So now if we know the relationship between genetic variants and network associated proteins, with regard to disease, can we begin to utilize this information to facilitate personalized genomic medicine? Well, to address that question, I'll give you an example of a, a recently published work, work on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As uh, many of you know, this is a highly common genetic cardiovascular disease. It is associated with thickening of the ventricular myocardium as illustrated on the right. There have been uh, over 11 sarcomeric proteins with more than 1400 genetic variants that are believed to associate with the disease. Uh, yet its clinical manifestations are uh, of highly variable penetrance. Put another way, only about 25% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy actually have 
mutations or variants in the sarcomeric proteins that are believed to be major drivers of the disease. So clearly the phenotype is much more complex uh, than was originally believed. Now to address this complexity, and this is a, a hard slide to follow, so I'll, you can use it for sort of background music and I'll, I'll try to summarize it more succinctly. Uh, what we did was we obtained heart tissue from patients undergoing septal uh, my myomectomy, septal reduction surgery to uh, limit uh, uh, the, the aortic gradient. And we obtained from that septal tissue uh, gene expression uh, data, transcriptome data, and we compared that transcriptome to the transcriptome of myocardial tissue specimens from normal hearts that were about to be implanted in patients receiving a heart transplant. These hearts as it, were ultimately rejected for implantation because of size differences, so we weren't harming heart tissue that would have gone into the patient. We then used a variety of statistical methods to look at differential gene expression and its localization, the location of these differentially expressed genes in the interactome. And this analysis really involved looking at uh, the consequences of specific variants influencing or perturbing correlations across the entire gene set. And that kind of analysis, this pairwise perturbation correlation analysis, led us to be able to create an individual protein interaction network for HCM for each patient. And here we see at the bottom of the slide an example of such an interaction network, an HCM interaction network. We performed this analysis in 18 patients. We had five or six controls. And you're obviously not able to see anything more than these little fuzzy uh, images here. The, the goal here is really to illustrate for you that even at this distance, one can appreciate the differences in the disease module for HCM for these 18 patients. And as we explored the specific differentially expressed genes in the different subgroups of these personalized interactomes, which I call reticulotypes after the Latin for network, um, is that certain subtypes of HCM have a certain clusters of uh, disease drivers or pathways in their disease module. And to be more specific, on the right, we illustrate examples of uh, a subgroup of patients in these 18 who have enhanced fibrosis with an, in a significant increase in the pathways that drive myocardial fibrosis represented in their reticulum or reticulotype. Now, using this kind of approach, we were able to identify a completely novel driver of HCM, which is JAK2. This is a well-known mediator of many malignancies and not previously been recognized as important in uh, cardiomyopathies or HCM in particular. And because there are available drugs that have been used against JAK2 associated malignancies, we have at hand the possibility for drug repurposing for this disease, which is the subject of ongoing work. So one can think of um, a network-based strategy uh, in the following way. The genotype from genomic analysis of a patient, the genetic variants can now be used to inform a reticulotype, which is a personalized disease network that can help distinguish among the different clinical manifestations of disease person to person. Uh, we can explore other related networks like endophenotype networks that govern intermediate phenotypes like inflammation, thrombosis, or fibrosis. And we also have uh, developed similar strategies for physiological phenotyping networks, uh, which uh, combined allow one to begin to predict drivers of disease and clinical outcomes. So now in the last 10 minutes or so, let me talk a little bit about the answer to this question. 
can this kind of protein-protein interaction network analysis facilitate drug target identification and uh, guide drug repurposing as one strategy for drug development that's become quite intriguing of late. And the basic motivation for this uh, question and this line of investigation is that since we now know increasingly the proteins that govern uh, disease uh, uh, pathobiology, we are confronted with a much greater number of potential disease targets that one drug targets that one can use to develop specific therapies, at least theoretically. Now, again, um, our approach to therapeutics is quite reductionist, and we have Ehrlich shown here to thank for this, uh, this current strategy. His magic bullet theory represents another form of reductionism in practice. Remember that he was a dye chemist, and um, his notion of the side, ch side chain theory of immunospecificity grew out of observations that different that dyes uh, stained different tissues differently. So that he argued that there were specific receptors, although he didn't actually call them receptors, side chains that interacted with the dyes that were tissue specific. And the leap here that he made was the, the concept that if that is the case, then perhaps these tissue specific side chains could also be used as a strategy for directing specific therapies. And of course, he was the, really the first chemical biologist, uh, first medicinal chemist who used low throughput screens by pulling chemicals off his shelf and testing each randomly. Uh, and of course, his first, um, uh, first success was the treatment of syphilis screened in this way uh, within arsenical preparation 606. Now let's hold, uh, let's keep the thought in mind that this reductionism, this notion of a magic bullet approach to treatments has um, uh, not yielded uh, what it had in the early days of pharmacologic discovery as illustrated here um, from uh, data that Harold Schmidt shared with me. Notice the y-axis is a log scale. Um, there is a, a, an increasing uh, limitation of the conventional target-based approach to identifying effective drugs. I think all, all folks in the pharmaceutical industry would appreciate that point. Another uh, interesting point to remember about drug development is that approved drugs really lack efficacy. They reach statistical significance required by the EMA and FDA in clinical trials. But as shown here, for the 10 highest grossing drugs, most profitable drugs in the US, um, they fail to help between three and 24 individuals. The, the green people here are those for whom the drugs are effective. So it's a, it's a, uh, I think it's a powerful slided image which highlights how many people we fail to benefit with the use of increasingly expensive drugs. Another a point to highlight, which, uh, of which you may not be aware, is the fact that drugs are very dirty, that even though we believe, very promiscuous, even though we believe that, uh, that a drug developed uh, by a, um, uh, a very uh, uh, effective uh, structural biological therapeutic strategy in a major drug company is highly specific for the target of interest. It is not. And here in a paper by Chatier and colleagues published a couple of years ago in which they used a bioinformatic approach to ask the question, how often does the so-called specific binding motif for a newly developed drug, how often does that motif recur throughout the proteome? And what they found, these are, the, I plotted their data in this distribution, but the data are theirs from their study. What they found was that on average, a so-called specific drug of the 475 they analyzed had more than, had on average 32 targets. Notice this is a very long tail distribution and most drugs have a significant number of targets. Very few have uh, one or two targets. So the, the reason that this is not emphasized is that no regulatory agency asks the pharmaceutical industry for this kind of unbiased analysis, A, B, 
uh, the methods for approaching this kind of unbiased analysis until, until recently have not been available. C, uh, they would divert attention from the focus of the development process, which stems from identifying a specific target as required by the regulatory agencies. But this, I view this as useful and helpful information, not unhelpful information, because it highlights A, why there are so many off-target effects and unpredicted toxicities when, once drugs are given to large numbers of patients. And B, it gives us a basis for considering the repurposable use of many drugs. So how can you think about drug target identification from a network perspective? Well, on the left, we show a, a typical uh, schema for a disease module within which there is a specific target shown in blue against which a drug is developed. And one can analyze the pathway within which that target sits uh, in a screen for compounds that, um, that may be helpful. But on the right, we have a different strategy. This is the network-based drug, drug repurposing strategy. The, the proximity hypothesis in which we, A, we first consider a disease module shown in pale blue here within which there is a drug target for the disease, but next to which T2, there's another drug target for another disease, but it's close enough to the disease module that we ask, can that same drug target and the drugs that are used to impair it and those drugs be repurposed for this disease? Uh, an example of um, the uh, answer to that question is shown here. This is recent work by Jun Sop Song and uh, Jane Leopold, in which they created the vascular calcification endophenotype module, within which they found some drug targets that, uh, against which there are known drugs like everolimus and temsorolimus, as well as pomalidomide, and showed in an in vitro assay here um, that um, a smooth muscle calcification, that these drugs could significantly impair calcification in this in vitro assay, and therefore they could be considered um, as potentially applicable to severe vascular calcification endophenotype patients. We have several other examples of repurposing, uh, most notable among which is repurposing drugs for coronary heart disease, um, for pulmonary hypertension. And in the interest of time, I can't share those with you today, but I will show you some very recent data that's timely related to drug repurposing using network strategies for SARS-CoV-2. Now here, the strategy is a little more complicated because we have to deal with three different networks. The viral protein network, there are 27 proteins that SARS-CoV-2 makes and they associate in various ways. And then a disease module network within the host cell, that is a group of proteins that associate with the viral proteins. And then a drug target disease module that is nearby the human covidome as we call it through which one perhaps might be able to identify repurposable drugs. So we first created um, uh, the covidome and the actual covidome is shown here on the left. And this was derived from the 332 human proteins that Gordon had shown last year in science bind to I believe 26 of the, of the 27 SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So there is a discrete disease module in the interactome that reflects the human proteins responsible for manifestations of COVID-19 infection. And in addition to the network proximity method, we developed two other methods with uh, collaborators um, that include a network diffusion strategy and an AI-based strategy that Marinka Zitnik um, helped us design uh, in this uh, paper that we published earlier this year. And using this strategy, we came up with a rank order of this combined strategy, a rank order for drugs that might be usefully repurposed for COVID-19. We then part collaborated with Rob Davey, who runs the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory here in Boston. And Rob um, then tested in a high throughput screen, the lead compounds 
and was able to confirm our predictions very effectively. And on the left here, I give you an example of a high throughput assay. The pinkish stain reflects viral antigens. The blue stain is, uh, represents the nuclei of the epithelial cells. And as you can see, remdesivir, which was a positive control, was quite effective at inhibiting viral replication. Um, in these assays, we can look at replication as well as cytotoxicity, and that's an important uh, consideration. What we found were uh, three uh, other drugs that were quite effective, emetine, prosilaridin, which is a cardiac glycoside, uh, and obatoclax, which was quite intriguing. This is a BCL2 inhibitor used for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancers and lymphomas. It's experimental. And um, uh, here we showed in an in vivo assay using mice that overexpress human ACE2 that obatoclax in female and male mice was quite effective in suppressing the viral titers to barely detectable levels in lung tissue. So that, um, uh, I, I should say that that methodology really is quite effective. It improves our ability to predict positive drugs in the, uh, uh, in the high throughput assay from 0.8% which is what um, uh, the typical yield is for random high throughput screens of hundreds of thousands of compounds to 35%. So our network-based predictions are uh, quite useful, reduce expense and time and highlight uh, unique, potentially unique repurposable drugs. Now the question is, can we expand the universe of repurposable drugs? And this is where work with uh, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and Felice Lightstone, who is uh, the head of their structural biology unit, uh, comes into play. We have a, a funding from the Department of Energy and the uh, U.S. Department of Energy and the American Heart Association uh, to establish the Center for Accelerated Drug Discovery. And we use their near exascale high performance computing system to do what would otherwise take about 20 years of in silico modeling to do uh, with conventional pharma-based uh, uh, in silico screening. And we are in the process of creating a huge matrix that involves about 2 million um, open access compounds and about 15, uh, 14,000 human proteins whose tertiary structures are either known or imputed from their congeners in other species. This matrix will allow us for the first time to identify in an unbiased way uh, drug targets unrelated to the drugs uh, for which, to, the, to the diseases for which the drugs were developed and may give us a more rational guide to drug repurposing opportunities. So I'll end with this slide, which highlights the, the summary of our approach, our network medicine-based approach to disease diagnosis and treatment, uh, emphasizing the importance of this notion of reticulotyping and of drug repurposing and novel drug target identification. We should, in the end, have subclusters of patients among those very many who don't respond to treatments that I showed you in that short slide uh, that we can now guide more specific targeted therapies more effectively. So I'll uh, acknowledge the folks whose names I mentioned throughout the talk on the left, uh, collaborators and on the right, um, uh, those, uh, those folks who did the work in our lab and other labs uh, over the last 10 years. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the kind invitation to participate in this wonderful symposium today. Thank you, uh, Professor Loscalzo. Uh, we will uh, immediately have a Q&A, <laughs> and um, I see someone applauding one of your peers is <laughs> applauding on, on Zoom. Um, I already have someone asking uh, a question, so I will ask uh, Professor Miriam Knopp uh, to unmute herself and to display her video if she can. Good morning, Professor Knopp. Good morning and, and good night, Dr. Los Calza. I really enjoyed your talk. That was beautiful. Um, my question was about um, whether you can give your views on how we should build such networks for diseases where um, the genetic variation really lies in non-coding regions. I myself work on type 1 and type 2 diabetes and 90% of the genetic variation that is associated with disease risk 
lies in non-coding regions, I feel there, there is a big knowledge gap that needs to be filled before we can actually um, build uh, precise networks for those diseases. But what, what's, your, what's your view? Yes, thank you for that question, uh, Professor Kopp. Kopp. The, um, uh, one of our first papers on network associations with disease was in pulmonary hypertension, now about 10 years ago, in which we created two networks, one of which was the protein, protein interaction network, and the other was a microRNA network. And we mapped this network of networks, we mapped the microRNAs to their targets in the disease module for pulmonary hypertension. And we're able to identify a novel microRNA that had not previously been shown to regulate disease phenotype. Uh, that was my, microRNA 21, which is known to affect many other phenotypes, but never in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so this notion of creating networks of networks that are, some of which are regulatory transcriptomic networks, some of which are uh, non-coding RNAs, like uh, uh, including microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs and circular RNAs. This is a growing area, and it, it, it's not, it, it is completely consistent with the notion of complex interactions. It's just on a different level. So uh, we published a paper uh, in, uh, uh, that reflected some of this work in diabetes with the late Amitabh Sharma uh, last year. And um, uh, in this uh, paper, we looked specifically at, uh, theoretically and, and through in vitro assays, at associations of non-coding RNAs to certain pathways that drive uh, disease phenotype. And um, I think this, uh, this allows one to explore this notion of effects at a distance within a disease module. So if you have a cluster of variants in a pathway that you know affects some biochemically accessible element or feature of the disease, and yet there is another differentially expressed set of proteins at a remote portion of the, in a remote portion of the interactome, it could be that that distance, that separation, is a consequence of a regulatory feature that hadn't been previously appreciated. So it, it plays right in very nicely into uh, making a complex story even more complex. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Knopp. Uh, Professor Badigon, you have a question. I will ask you to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I hope you, you can hear me. So, so that was brilliant, Joe. Thanks again uh, for your lecture. Um, I just want to come back to the, um, the slide you, where you highlighted the fact that any drug has much more than a few targets. And obviously, yes, that, that property and that observation can be used for drug repurposing. But, but on the other end, you could, you could use this information perhaps the other way around and, uh, and, and, and consider that all known targets that have been identified for each drug uh, that works in a specific disease may actually indicate nodes of that disease that hasn't been anticipated before. And, and so could, could that be used to enhance our understanding of pathophysiology of the disease? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I think um, in this case, what you're suggesting, and, and I, I completely support, is that drugs can be viewed as perturbance uh, to a unique network for an individual patient. And there are other drivers of the disease in addition to the single protein against which the drug was first developed that the drug may also influence or affect. Maybe other members of the same class of kinases, for example weakly, but still. Um, uh, so yes, I think you can use this uh, pluripotent perturbation effect of most drugs as a way to explore other features of disease drivers. You can also use this strategy as a way to identify drug toxicities, of course. We've, in, a, in ongoing work that we haven't yet published, we've done that for long QT syndrome and uh, um, created, we're able to identify the uh, the disease module for long QT uh, syndrome as a side effect and uh, show that it overlaps with many other pathways in cardiomyopathies modules. So uh, it, there are different, depending upon your perspective, you can use this very, uh, this very uh, interesting observation of Chartier as a, as a, a very usefully. 
<laughs> voilà. Professor Casimir, you have a question. I see all the question in the chat. So if um, may I ask you, uh, Professor Lescazo, if you are going to uh, stay with us until the end of the session, or if you are going to leave. No, I'll, I'll, I'll stay. You will be yeah. there for the round table then. Yes. You confirm that. So uh, we will ask the other questions during uh, the round table. So do not hesitate to flag your other questions. But Professor Casimir, the floor is yours for uh, this question. And then we will move. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Los Calzo, for this fascinating lecture. Uh, my question is, could we imagine in the future that patients could carry a, a smart card indicating the characteristic of an important part of their proteome of protein interaction upon, upon admission to the hospital in order to define part of the treatments that will be provided to them? Yes, wonderful question. Wonderful question. I, I think I, I, I absolutely believe that that's the case. And in fact, it may be carried as a hologram. My colleague Barbasi is also a sculptor, a sculptor. And um, he has a, uh, he's just had a showing of work, not of his, but of others, of three and two dimensional versions of networks in Budapest, which will be going to Munich next. And uh, some of the concepts shown there illustrate how uh, this kind of imaging, uh, virtual imaging, you can sort of walk through the network and identify those areas where there are variants and begin to explore your own network and what risks you may be uh, uh, you may have as a consequence wonderful question thank you thank you very much